Let's ask another question, since we're looking at how these rule sets project down and renormalize. And in particular, let's look at rule 110 again. If you remember, rule 110 was kind of a magical rule because it turned out that it was Turing complete. What that means, of course, is that given a sufficiently well-specified, sufficiently complicated initial condition, if you pick the right one and evolve rule 110 forward, you actually are able to perform an arbitrary computation. But then you say, wow, well, if I can use Israeli and Goldenfeld's methods to coarse grain rule 110, then the following thing could happen. Let's say that the projection operator kept enough of the stuff that I was interested in that I could use it. So, you know, I put in my initial conditions, I set up my program and run it forward. And let's say the output of that program, it's good enough if I have just some coarse grain knowledge of that output. I don't need all the details. It's kind of like a lossy compression of it. Well, if that's true, right? Then all of a sudden I can speed up my system by an enormous amount. If I find that projection operator and I can find an evolution rule that works, not only can I do the computation in half the time, because instead of going from t to t plus 1 to t plus 2, I can jump from t to t plus 2. Not only can I do the computation in half the time, but I can also do it in half the space, because that projection operator takes pairs of cells that make a supercell and projects it down to this new coarse grained object. So if I get lucky, with rule 110, it may be the case that in fact, I can evolve the system forward and do a computation, doing a, do a Turing universal computation in half the space and half the time. If the projection keeps the things that I care about. So Israeli and Goldfeld looked at this, and of course this is the big question, right? Is it possible to find a good projection operator? And as far as they can tell, at least on the scales they work, the answer is no. They were able to find non-trivial projections for rule 110, and non-trivial projection here meaning the projection operator doesn't just map everything to black or everything to white, because that's kind of a trivial one, right? They were able to find non-trivial projections for rule 110, but unfortunately the projections didn't keep everything we cared about, and in fact they almost kept nothing that we cared about. They worked sort of with a kind of unfair trick. So the thing about rule 110, and this is often true for cellular automata, is that there are certain supercell patterns that can never be produced by the evolution rule. You can program them in, you can code them in in the initial conditions, so they appear at step zero, but they immediately disappear when you get to step one, and they never reappear no matter what else is going on in the system. These are these Garden of Eden states. So Garden of Eden here meaning, okay, they might exist at the beginning, but the system never will produce them naturally. Once they're gone, they're gone forever, and the evolution operator will never recreate them. They're kind of expelled, right, from the Garden of Eden. So Rule 110 has Garden of Eden states. It destroys them irreversibly at the first time step. And so now you can probably guess what this projection operator is going to do. What it's going to do is it's going to take supercells that uh, our Garden of Eden states and project those to, let's say, the black pixel. It's going to take the non-Garden of Eden states and project them to the white pixel. And now the evolution is very simple. Black pixels turn into white pixels and white pixels stay white. So it's a non-trivial projection. It doesn't take every state to the same color. Some states go to black and some states go to white. And in fact, the evolution is extremely simple. It takes all black states to white and all white states to white. But it doesn't really do anything you particularly want. It doesn't enable you to compute anything useful. In fact, it doesn't tell you anything you didn't already know. Because at the end of your simulation, you know that the output can't contain Garden of Eden states, and that's pretty much all that renormalization process has told you. Rule 110, in other words, coarse grains, even under a non-trivial projection, to rule zero. So, where are we? We've talked a little bit about rule 105 coarse grain to rule 150. We've talked about how that projection operator is actually quite interesting. It's sort of an edge detector. It's different from how we decimated the Alice picture. We also talked a little bit about that huge network of how things coarse grain into each other. That's fun. 
I told you a little bit about, okay, look, at some point Israeli and Goldfarb ran out of computer power, so they couldn't fill out the full network. So there's bits of that network that have properties you don't expect, like A can coarse grain to B and B can coarse grain to C, but Israeli and Goldenfeld weren't able to find the projection that got A to coarse grain to C, and that's just, again, because they're limited, right? It's a finite problem, or they have a finite time to solve an infinite problem. There's a final question which I want you to ask or think about, which is what if we specified the projection ahead of time? What if we asked, in other words, the, uh, the computer to find an evolution operator that worked for a projection that we had picked? And here I've given an example. This is rule 90. And on the right-hand side, I've taken rule 90, I've taken the output of the evolution of rule 90, and I've used a kind of Alice coarse graining. I've used one of those decimation coarse grainings where I take a cell and I just knock out all of the values and pick the first one as the cell-defining value. So rule 190 on the left and the output of rule 90 on the right. And you can see it's much sparser now because in fact, this evolution process here produces a lot of isolated pixels and really it's only the dense packets, right? The places where those triangles collide that actually survive in that coarse graining, right? So you kind of squint at it like, yeah, really what you get are these sort of little patchy triangles. So is it possible now, you might ask, to find an evolution rule that works for that particular coarse graining, that kind of zoom out coarse graining that we often find rather appealing? And the answer, it turns out, is no. And it's no for a very interesting reason. If I zoom in here, as I've shown you on this picture, if I zoom in to part of the coarse grain version, you can see I have a kind of a, a clump of pixels a couple time steps away, and then I have a pair of pixels below. And you see that pixel that turned on there with the arrow pointing to it? Why did that bit switch on? Now, if I look at the fine grain level, I can tell you exactly why, right? That was the collision of two sort of more lightly colored triangles, right? Less dense triangles that collided and then produced this little spark point. But if I only look at the coarse grained information, it looks like that bit came out of nowhere. All of the pixels above that point are all white, and somehow that set of all white pixels produced an on bit. But if I look two time steps back, that set of pixels was also all white and didn't. It didn't produce a spot. So what made one time step different from another? Now, one thing you could say is, oh, well, look, you know, it's true that one time step back, there was nothing. And even two time steps back, there was nothing. But in fact, look, if I go back long enough, I can see that, yeah, a little bit further back, there were in fact a bunch of pixels. And maybe there's some rule that says, okay, look, you got those two pixels down there, or that particular pixel you care about, and somewhere up here there's stuff. So I just have to kind of wait a little bit longer, right? I have to coarse grain in time a bit more, and then maybe I can get that evolution rule out. The only problem is, and maybe you can see this from how rule 190 looks at the fine grain level, is that I can make those colliding appearing triangles arbitrarily far apart. I can create an arbitrary distance between the dense intersections of triangles at one stage and the dense intersection of triangles at another stage, just by changing the initial conditions. Another way to say that is that a coarse grain cellular automata may no longer have a local update rule, no matter how far I zoom out. You need arbitrarily distant points to explain why something flickered on. It's sort of like some kind of action at a distance. If I coarse grain in this way, if I do this projection down coarse graining, it appears that in fact something has sprung from nothing. And no matter how I try to sort of hard code a long distance relationship in by coarse graining in time, I can always make a longer distance relationship. So there are some projections that make rule 90 undescribable using this local rule. And I say local here meaning the value of a pixel at this point depends only upon the value at a time just previous. Another way to say this, and now we can use some language from physics, is that rule 190, or sorry, rule 90 is non-renormalizable under the Alice coarse graining. If that's the kind of projection you need or want to do, there's no way to stay within the same model class. There's no way to get a cellular automata that can predict or describe or explain what's happening after you do that coarse graining. The diagram, a diagram that commutes can no longer be found. It's not that the story is impossible to work with, 
But what you have to do now is you have to go beyond the cellular automata description to work at that coarse grained level. When that happens in physics, we get really upset because you spend a lot of time working with one kind of model class, right? Maybe it's a deterministic update rule, maybe it's a bunch of matrices, maybe it's some you know, crazy quantum field theory. You spend a lot of time learning to work with a model. Then when we coarse grain it, somebody calls us up and says, ah, look, I'm really sorry. Um, I know you got really good at solving that model, but you want to do that coarse graining. And unfortunately, when you do that, there's no way that the model you're really good at working with can actually describe the coarse grain system. And that's so traumatic for physicists, they call the system non-renormalizable and they spend a lot of time, a great deal of time, worrying about it. In fact, actually, one of the big challenges of physics, certainly physics after 1950, was the realization that in fact gravity didn't work in the way it needed to work in order for it to be renormalizable. When you zoomed out, something went wrong. And if you produced a model of gravity at one scale and projected it down, coarse grained it, you somehow no longer had a good model at the other scale. It was somehow driving you in the wrong direction. So pictures like this often tell us something we want to know about the world. We want to know how the world simplifies. Very often we get lucky and when we simplify the world, we can still use a model to describe it that worked for us when we looked at the fine grain scale. And fortunately, in some systems, when we coarse grain, even though the world looks simpler, even though the picture looks less detailed, even though there's less to keep track of, that actually makes it harder to find a model. Just because you simplify your description, it doesn't mean that you simplify your explanation.